Well, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for your patience. Um, my name is Ginger Weyerman, and we're glad to have you here to um, participate in our Let's Talk About Hanford tonight, themed Hanford Geology, Floods, Lava, and More. And um, gosh, this is our fifth or sixth episode of Let's Talk About Hanford, and we are using this to be able to reach audiences that we can't reach because we have been all stuck in our homes and not going out into public to do public speaking. So this has been great and we are really excited to have Bruce Bjornstad with us tonight. Um, Bruce is a licensed geologist and hydrogeologist and retired senior researcher from Battelle's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. He earned a bachelor's degree in geology from University of New Hampshire and a master's in geology from Eastern Washington University. And during his 35 year career, Bruce published numerous reports and documents on the geology of Eastern Washington and the Hanford site, in addition to numerous books on the local Ice Age mega floods. So we are excited to have Bruce here tonight, but real quick, Brian's, uh, Ryan's going to go over some housekeeping and then we will get into the um, presentation. Perfect, thanks Ginger. And thanks again everybody for your patience as we as we got everything set up um, a few minutes late today. Uh, so as per usual with our Let's Talk About Hanford events, we're gonna start the night with a presentation. This time it'll be Bruce, you know, covering Hanford geology. Um, and after that, we're gonna move into a live Q&A with you, the audience. So anytime during tonight's event, you can input any questions or comments you have into the chat if you're on Zoom or the chat if you're on Facebook. And since this is our first time on Zoom, uh, after Bruce's presentation, I'm gonna uh, change the feature so that, that those in attendance on the Zoom call can unmute themselves and turn on their cameras if they would like to you know, uh, verbally ask their own question to Bruce, or you could just put your question in the chat, either would be just fine. Um, so definitely as our event goes on, if you have any questions about tonight's presentation, feel free to put it into the chat. And um, it's just a reminder, these presentations are geared to be more high level information. And for those who are new to, or getting to know about the Hanford area, or those you know, who only know parts of Hanford, I'm like a refresher. So we really try to keep these high level so everybody can understand them pretty easily. Um, so like I kind of mentioned before, we encourage questions and comments into the chat at any time, but we, we do ask that you please gear your questions to Hanford area geology as that's Bruce's area of expertise and not Hanford's like cleanup or other. Um, off, you know, other topics. We'll do our best to answer your questions, but if we get questions that are off topic, we'll probably have to defer your questions to a future event where we focus on that specific topic you're asking about. Um, alternatively, you can always send those questions to our email at hanford at ecy.wa.gov. Again, that's hanford at ecy. I'm sorry, ecy.wa.gov, and I'll put this into, into the chat as well. But if you have any questions about Hanford, um, feel free to stick them into that uh, email and we can answer those um, off air as well. Uh, but with that, let's go ahead and kick over to Bruce and, and he can start teaching us about Hanford's geology. Over to you, Bruce. Okay, well, thank you for uh, that introduction. That's a pleasure to be talking to you guys uh, about Hanford. Uh, I've been out away from the Hanford site working as a geologist for about eight years, but the geology really hasn't changed much during that time. So uh, hopefully I can, I can uh, shed some light on the geology of Hanford for everybody. So here's my cover of my presentation. And uh, I think Dana who's there with you guys is gonna bring my presentation to the floor to the screen, there we are. And uh, this is a view looking uh, across the Hanford site uh, and the Columbia River and the White Bluffs in the background. Uh, the, the geology of the Hanford is very diverse and it's fairly unique. There's really, uh, it's got a, a, an assemblage of flood feet of uh, geologic features that are kind of unique to anywhere else in the world. So. It is a unique uh, geologic environment. And uh, that's what uh, my presentation is about today. So let's go on to the next slide. Uh, it's important, first of all, to set the, the stage for the geology and that the, the geology is really based on the stratigraphy, the, uh, these deposits, the geologic uh, evidence for past events on the Hanford site. And 
that is uh, revealed here in the stratigraphy. Uh, as you can see here, that we have the Columbia River basalt down at the bottom. That's the oldest unit, geologic unit. And then we have something called the Ringgold Formation, which are sedimentary deposits over the basalt. And then above that, we have these uh, big ice age flood uh, coming through the, the, the Pasco Basin through the Hanford site. And it deposited up to 300 feet of flood deposits over the Ringgold Formation and the basalt. And lastly, we have a, a, the frosting on the cake are these uh, a thin sequence of wind-blown deposits, which have uh, blown across and been deposited on the Hanford site or since the last floods about 14,000 years ago. So that's those, this is the foundation. This particular is the foundation for the talk that I'll be presenting tonight. So next slide. Uh, we know the subsurface geology at Hanford based on wells and boreholes that have been drilled on the site and around the site. And here you can see the, you can see that where the Columbia River comes through, the Hanford site is basically that really dense cluster of wells that you can see uh, off on the left side of the, and lower left side of this, this diagram. And uh, let's uh, we'll, uh, click next, go next. And as you can see here, we have over 11,000 holes have been drilled on the Hanford site since the 1940s and next. But only about 4,000 of those are still being used or they're still available for use. A lot of the wells have been, uh, have been decommissioned and are no longer in use. So we, we actually have about 4,000 wells, but with, those, with that number of wells, you can get a fairly good detail on the subsurface geology of Hanford. And the reason for Knowing that is because of the you know contamination and the waste sites that are on Hanford site. So you really need a lot of wells to really understand what's going on in the subsurface and how these contaminants move over time. Next, here's a geologic cross section. Okay, going from north to south, and uh, it's it's showing you these different units that. Uh, and I've laid out the Columbia River basalt is that gray area down in the bottom. That's, uh, that's down hundreds of feet below the Hanford site. And uh, I'll be talking about a lot of these individually in the coming slides. And we have a thing called the Coal Creek Syncline, which is a, a basin that was formed due to the, due to Yakima, the Yakima folds, tectonic deformation folding of the basalts has created this basin uh, beneath the Hanford site. And above the, the, the basalt, you can see there's a thing called the Ringgold Formation. And that goes up to uh, Coal Creek Unit, which I'm not gonna really talk about much today. It's fairly thin and it's not continuous everywhere. I'm not gonna talk about that so much, but above that you can see is the Hanford Formation. And the, the Ringgold Formation is both within the saturated zone beneath Anford, which is the area where there's, there's water, groundwater is filling all the pores and the sediment. And then we have the Vado zone, which is above that. And that's the area above the water table where, th where the sediments are unsaturated. In other words, there's not, a, there's not much water present in that uh, Vado zone. And uh, so let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> and here you can uh, see the distribution of the basalt, Columbia River basalt, which is in gray on this map, and in contrast to where the Ice Age floods came through, which is the area in blue. So that you can see the Hanford site experienced both the floods from volcanic lava flows as well as floods from the uh, glacial Lake Missoula. Okay, next. And that circle, the oval is indicating where we have the basalt coming out of basalt feeder dikes down in the Southeast part of Washington, Northeast part of Oregon, Western part of Idaho was the source for all the lava, is all lava that came out. Um, these are feeder dikes of the Columbia River basalt. 
And basically when the lava came out, it flowed downstream by under gravity coming, coming to the surface. And most of that the gravity and the area um, downstream was to the west. So basically the basalts were flowing out onto the channel scab land of Washington and then down the Columbia River Gorge and then eventually out uh, as far as the Pacific Ocean. Next. So there are up to 300 separate lava flows, Columbia River basalt lava flows that came out between about 17 million years ago and the last ones coming out about eight to 10 million years ago. And coming out of these dikes and then spreading out across uh, Eastern Washington. The combined thickness, the maximum thickness for those lava flows is about 15,000 feet. And that is down uh, in the Prosser area to the west, south and west of the Hanford site is the actual, uh, the depot center or where the center of the Columbia River basalts and their thickest accumulation. Okay, next. The, uh, the ice age or the, uh, the Columbia River basalts uh, reached about 10,000 feet thick underneath the Hanford site. And here you can see uh, where the, the lava flows are outcrop at the surface at two, uh, two wind water gaps, one called the Blue Gap, which is on the left. And then there's another place called Sentinel Gap on the right, uh, where you can actually see these lava flows come, where they come to the surface. But these same lava flows uh, go, to, go underground and down another uh, 10,000 feet or more beneath the Hanford site. Okay, next. And these lava flows, they, uh, the, they, there's quite a bit of heterogeneity, a lot of variation within these lava flows. But most lava flows show a zone of what we call columnar basalt, where the lava was insulated and cooling very slowly after it came out. And then there's another uh, zone of basalts called the vesicular zone which is a more hackly, more random, tightly uh, fractured rock above the columnar basalt. So those are the two major zones of these lava flows and they do affect the way water, groundwater moves through these lava flows. Next. So uh, here's the Hanford site in red. And what I'm showing on this map are the uh, Yakima Falls starting with the Columbia Hills down on the south and ending with the Saddle Mountains. And there's another uh, fold called the Frenchman Hills, which are north of the Saddle Mountains. That's not shown on this map. But these, these are the Yakima Folds, and these are places where the uh, salt flows have been folded, have been deformed uh, by squeezing of the crust. And uh, you can see uh, within the Hanford site, we have the Gable Mountain and incline the Rattlesnake Mountain and a climb, which is to the south, the Yakima Ridge to the west, Silo Mountains to the north surrounding us. Next. And here's, here's the locations of a little of the gap and Sentinel Gap that I showed in the previous slide showing you where, they, where the, these basalt flows are cropping out onto the surface and exposed so that we can see them. But those same flows extend underneath the Hanford site and in the valleys or the synclines in between these uh, Yakima folds. So the folds themselves are anticlines, which are upfolded basalts. And then in between the, these ridges, we have valleys or synclines, which uh, tended to accumulate sediments since uh, they were formed starting about uh, 10 to 12 million years ago. Next. So here's kind of a cross, cross section here showing you how these Yakima folds develop. When the lavas came out, they, they came out as flat pancake like uh, lava flows that spread out for hundreds of miles, dozens to hundreds of miles uh, in many different directions. And then after the lava flows hardened, the, uh, the earth's crust was getting squeezed from the north and from the south. And uh, so that 
uh, we get these ridges or wrinkles in that basalt surface. So here you can see uh, the upfolded areas of, of basalt are called anticlines and the downfolded areas are synclines that have accumulated sediments, sedimentary deposits since the lavas came out. And occasionally that those uh, folds can be folded so drastically and so, so forcefully that it can generate faults. You can see there's one overturned limb of a fault along a fault line in the right hand side in this image. Not all the not all of the folds have these faults, but many do, and they're they're always uh, uh, being they're overturned to the north. So that's an indication that the, the force that was creating these folds was being directed from the south. The area to the north was more uh, rigid, and uh, was a was a, was and wasn't really moving much, but the area to the south was getting moved and pushed to the north that created these uh, anticlines and synclines and uh, faults that you can see here. Next. All right, so uh, now we're gonna try to, here we go, we have a video showing uh, the basalts in a place called the Sentinel Gap, which is where the, uh, the Columbia River cuts through the Saddle Mountains. So this is an anticline and these are basalts that uh, were taken with the drone. You can see there's dozens of lava flows represented here in, in this exposure. And you can see some areas where there's a columnar basalt separated by areas with this more uh, tightly fractured uh, entablature basalt. And there is a white band that runs through uh, through the middle of this. That's uh, actually a sedimentary inner bed called the Vantage inner bed that was laid down between basalt flows. So these basalt flows were coming out between about uh, 10 to 17 million years ago. And when I showed you pictures of the Yakima folds and, the, and where they're located, you can see in this image, the green lines are these Yakima Falls. And the reason that the, they're there and it's kind of restricted to this area is because this whole area is being tectonically rotated in a clockwise direction. And that, that this is all related to plate tectonics uh, related to the subduction zone where, uh, where the Pacific plate, the Feralian plate, so the, on the west side uh, in the ocean, west of Washington and Oregon, were being subducted obliquely to the northeast. And that pu the pushing of those tectonic plates down into the subduction zone has caused the crust to rotate in a clockwise direction. And the blue arrows and the red arrows you can see here are, are relative for, uh, distances that the plate the, uh, the North American plate has been rotated over the last 40 million years. And it's continuing today. These are actually real, real life. This is real time data that was collected for one year or, or maybe the average of several years showing you how much tectonic rotation has occurred. And they've measured these, this dis these distances using uh, GPS units that are uh, spread out across the Northwest. So these are real-time data collected in the last couple dozen years, showing you the amount of tectonic rotation that's occurred. And over on the West side of the state, uh, there's been up to 10, 10 to 20 millimeters per year of tectonic rotation. Next. And uh, that, that 10 to 20 millimeters per year is about how long or how much distance your fingernails grow in one year. So the rate of tectonic deformation is relatively slow, but spread out over millions, 20 to 30, 40 million years, you can easily get lots of tectonic rotation taking place. And it's these, this rotation, it's moving against the stationary crust north of the Hanford site that is causing these ridges to form in the basalt. Next. And the pivot point for that rotation is right 
in our neighborhood, right in nearby uh, Pendleton, Oregon, which is just south and west, south and east of the Hanford site. Next. Okay, so moving on from the uh, basalts, the next youngest geologic unit is what we call the Ringgold Formation. Okay, these are ancient river and lake deposits, probably from the ancestral Columbia and Snake Rivers. The same rivers that flow through uh, through our area today were actually uh, depositing sediments within this syncline or this basin in between the Saddle Mountains and Rattlesnake Mountain. Uh, and depositing the Ringgold Formation starting about 3 million years ago, starting at 10 million years ago and ending at about 3 million years ago for the Ringgold Formation. Next. Next, there we go. So now we have another video showing you the Ringgold Formation. These are mostly uh, deposits of silt and clay uh, here along the White Bluffs. You can see the, the it's very colored, brown, grays, greens, uh, lots of clay and silt, uh, and lots of sand deposits that were laid down by the ancestral Columbia in this area and Snake River elsewhere. And in the distance, you can see there's, uh, these, there's some sand dunes that are uh, de being deposited above the bluffs by winds that are blowing across the Hanford site against the white bluffs and then blowing sand up onto the top of the bluffs. There's a huge landslide complex there too. You can see in the middle of this image that is formed from water, uh, what water saturated sediments that have moved along landslides more recently. And there's the Hanford site is up and then the upper left of this image at H reactor. You can see cocooned uh, there in that image. Okay, so moving on to uh, uh, past the Ringgold Formation, which ended about 3 million years ago. And then sometime around during the Ice Age, which started two and a half million years ago, we started getting mega floods coming from glacial lakes uh, from the Ice Age, during the Ice Age. And the most notorious floods are from Glacial Lake Missoula that you can see in this image. It's that dark blue area in the upper right. And what happened during the Ice Age, we know this happened at least 100 times during the last uh, glacial cycle. But there, there were older Ice Ages that occurred previously, going all the way back to maybe one to two million years, where we had similar ice dams forming and Glacial Lake glacial lakes forming that, that cause floods to travel through this, through Eastern Washington. So here you can see the ice dam in the upper right creating Glacial Lake Missoula. And then what happened periodically is that ice dam would break uh, as the lake filled up behind it and caused all that lake water from Lake Missoula to drain out in just a matter of a week or less out across the channel scab land, uh, across the Hanford site, which is shown uh, in the next, um, if we can, there we go, the, the red uh, rectangle is near the, uh, the Hanford site. There we back up. And uh, there you can see the, the, these ice age floods traveled across Eastern Washington through the, Han by, the by the Hanford site. And they all had, they were all forced to go down through that one little opening called the Willilla Gap at the Idaho or at the Washington Oregon border. From there, they went down through the Columbia River Gorge, backed up into the Willamette Valley, south of Berlin, before eventually draining out to the Pacific Ocean. These floods all, all took from start to finish, lasted probably only a couple of weeks or less during each one of these floods. Okay, next. <clears throat> okay, here you can see the effects of the, uh, the floods on our area. In the upper left, you can see I've outlined the Hanford site there, but you can see it was totally submerged in blue, in that blue area, that was all the backwater, uh, the flood waters coming in to the, into the Pasco Basin, backing up behind the Gap and flooding the Pasco Basin, 
up to 1,250 feet elevation, which would have completely submerged the Hanford site. All the areas in brown would have been up, would have been above flood level, and the, the areas in blue were submerged. The darker the blue, the more the deeper the water uh, during one of these floods. And in the lower right, you can see an oblique view of how these floods might have looked uh, when they came into the Pasco Basin across uh, Tri Cities. Uh, just can just the tops of Candy Mountain and Badger Mountain would have been islands within this lake that was uh, went up to 1,250 feet elevation with lots of icebergs floating around from the breakup of the ice dam from Glacier Lake, Missoula. Next. And as I said earlier, there were up to 100, 100 of these ice age floods that occurred between 14,000 and 20,000 years ago. And we know that based on uh, sedimentary deposits that we see in back flooded valleys like the Yakima Valley and the Walla Walla Valley, the Willamette Valley in Oregon, all show these rhythmite, what we call rhythmites, each of one, each rhythmite representing a separate flood from Glacial Lake, Missoula. Next. So here's, uh, here's an example of uh, what one of these uh, erratics that we call floated, floating in on icebergs would have looked like. And this one happens to be in the Willamette Valley. It's called the Bellevue erratic. Next. And it, it rafted in on the iceberg. It, it floated up along the margins of the Willamette Valley. And uh, it ended up on the, the valley sides and the ice eventually melted. You know, within months or years, the ice melted, leaving behind uh, its payload of, uh, of boulders, rock boulders that were left behind and that we can see today, remnants of these ice age floods calling cards of the Ice Age floods. Next. And closer to home here in the Tri-Cities and adjacent to the Hanford site on the Rattlesnake Mountain. And I've shown, here's a map of Rattlesnake Mountain, which uh, borders the, uh, the Hanford site. And you can, each one of those uh, um, uh, symbols you can see on that map is a, either a berg mound, which is a big pile of debris that rafted in on a really big iceberg, or uh, a cluster of erratics, a grouping of erratics, and in some cases, isolated erratics that uh, are spread out across the, the Hanford site and Rattlesnake Mountain in particular. Next. And uh, here's, here's a, a LIDAR image this is a new imaging technique that really shows uh, subtle changes in topography uh, that's become available recently. And these are uh, erg mounds on Rattlesnake Mountain. Next. And the red arrows are indicating individual erg mounds. There are hundreds of these up on Rattlesnake Mountain, as you can see on this map. Next. And the erg mounds go up to about a thousand feet elevation, but we know the floods went up another 200 feet above that based on the distribution of, of erratics up to that elevation. So why do the Berg Mounds, uh, why are they limited to only the lower slopes of Rattlesnake Mountain? So in the next image, uh, here's a cross section showing you how, they, how these icebergs uh, and Berg Mounds actually form. The larger icebergs go deeper into the lake, lake bottom, so that they were not, they were prevented from getting up close to the, the higher elevations of the lake on Rattlesnake Mountain. So we have a, we have, because we have bigger icebergs, we have more, more ice rafted debris uh, in these bigger icebergs. So therefore we get mounds forming at the uh, further away from the shoreline for Lake Lewis. Whereas the smaller icebergs were able to get up up to the edge of the, the lake, but because they're smaller, they don't have as much debris and therefore it didn't leave behind icebergs or berg mounds. Next. So um, 
these are some examples of the flood deposits in the, um, near the Hanford site. We have, uh, we have a, a, a range of different types of sediments we, where the floods were moving really fast and furious. We get gravel dominated deposits like we see in the upper right, <coughs> but where the waters were able to slow down when they backed up behind a little gap around the margins of the basin, we get, uh, we get slack water deposits depositing mostly sand and silt. And those are represented in the images on the upper left and the middle there. So we, we get a range of sediments deposited and it's these rhythmic beds of sand and silt that record the multiple floods that we see from, from Lake Missoula. Next. And in this image in the center, you can see there's some these rhythmic beds that are separated by a band, a white band. And that happens to be a, a, a volcanic ash from Mount St. Helens that erupted about 15,000 years ago during or in between one of these ice age floods. Next. So here we have another video showing you uh, some of these slack water flood deposits or rhythmites graded beds of sand and silt and gravel that is represented in the Walla Walla Basin. We don't, you know, Walla Walla Basin's a ways away, but we have these similar deposits. We've seen them in boreholes that we've drilled underneath the Hanford site. We see deposits that are identical to this. You now you can really see the multiple layers of sediment that were laid down. Each layer represents uh, a separate flood. From Lake Missoula. And here we happen in this exposure, we happen to see as many as 60 of these rhythmites or graded beds of sand and silt that represent a separate flood from Lake Missoula. And as you can see, the beds get thinner and smaller as you go up section, which, an which is an indication that the floods were getting smaller over time. Okay, so um, now we're going we're gonna to look at the uh, sand dunes, uh, what's happened since the Ice Age floods. Not much has happened on the Hanford site, except there's been a lot of wind and it's reworked a lot of these flood deposits that were, deposit that were brought in. And on this image, you can actually see flood bars and channels. The blue, air the blue arrows are flood channels that were eroded uh, when the floods came through the Hanford site. It's superimposed on top of those flood deposits, you can see there's a thin veneer of, of wind-blown sand and creating these dunes. Next. And there's two types of sand, uh, sand dunes. There's these longitudinal dunes that trend, uh, that go for miles and miles, mostly in an east-west direction. And then we have another type of sand dune, next called parabolic dunes. And the para parabolic dunes, you don't see them off to the west as much. They're kind of restricted to that one little area next to the river. And those are there because of uh, Ringgold Coulee, which is a flood coulee. And it acts like a wind tunnel. The predominant wind direction is coming from the southwest so that uh, these longitudinal, longitudinal dunes form uh, uh, to the north, south. But, there in the middle at the parabolic dunes, we have a wind tunnel effect that created these beautiful parabolic dunes, uh, arc-shaped arc, arc dunes uh, in this one restricted area. Okay, so next. And here's a, here's a, a drone video showing you these parabolic dunes, looking kind of to the west. They're beautiful sand. They're very active. I mean, they're still moving today. They're very active. There's the Columbia River. And uh, Ringo Cooley is off in the upper right. So that's, that's a lower area where the floods eroded a channel. And the winds coming from the west preferentially blow th through across Hanford, up Ringo Cooley, and therefore have created these isolated uh, parabolic dunes that we see here. Okay, so that's the end of my uh, the slideshow. And I guess I'll let uh, Ryan and uh, Dana and 
Ginger, uh, take it, take it, take over from here, and I'll answer any questions. Perfect. Thanks, Bruce. That was an amazing presentation. And I know we especially appreciate, you know, the time you took to put that together. And, and we do have a list of questions that are that are ready for your answering here. Um, I'm going to go ahead on Zoom here and turn on the features for, for guests to unmute themselves and start their video. I would appreciate, though, if, if anybody would like to unmute themselves and ask a question that you just uh, say you'd like to ask a question in the chat. That way we don't get a lot of people speaking over each other. We do have one person so far that, that did say they wanted to unmute. Um, so let me go ahead and turn on those features. And we also have a uh, Facebook questions we'll ask as well. Um, all right, so Maya, I believe you had a question and you should have the option to turn on your camera and unmute now if you wanna ask Bruce your question. Hi, yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. I was just wondering- You're welcome. Um, you, you spend time looking at the past of Hanford's geology, and I'm wondering if you can use what's happened in the past to kind of predict the future of what will happen, let's say, 10,000 years from now, what the, uh, the geology specifically at Hanford will look like, for example, like would the Columbia River move, um, any, any kind of insight into that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Well, yeah, that's a, a really good question. Unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball, but um, like we can, you know, the past is maybe an indication of what's in the future. The Yakima folds will are are continuing to grow, and they're still growing today. So these ridges are going to keep growing, uh, getting probably bigger uh, over time, and there there's. Uh, very likely uh, going to be ice age floods again in the future. I mean, we the history of flooding goes back two and a half million years, and uh, the the last event was fifteen thousand years ago. So it's there'll be there, unless we've permanently changed the climate uh, due to global warming or whatever, uh, we we should go back into another ice age because. Uh, they, they have been very cyclic and they've been occurring for, for millions of years. So it's likely that there could be other, other ice ages in the future and more ice age floods because uh, the, all the elements are still there for, for flooding to reoccur, except for an ice dam, which isn't there now, but there could be in the future. So I'd say it, it could, you know, there'll be, there'll be more changes, maybe, the, uh, similar to what we've had in the past, and who knows what what other changes might occur. Well, thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Maya, for your question. Um, we'll skip over to Facebook for a question here. This one was asked by Anthony early on in the presentation, Bruce. Uh, he asked, what size are these holes? And I think that was in reference to the slide that was covering the typical hydrogeologic cross-section on that slide, or the slide before, at least. What, what size are what, the holes? Yeah. Does that mean the wells? Oh, the wells. Okay, oh, yeah, yeah, the drill holes. It. The drill holes, yeah, they're, uh, they vary in size uh, from a few inches up to um, a foot or even bigger in some cases. So yeah, those, they're, they're, they're small boreholes generally uh, used for drilling. They're what they're cheaper. The smaller they are, the cheaper and the more, you know, the more you can get, the more wells you can drill by using smaller holes. So they're pretty small. So, yep. Okay, we had a question in uh, Zoom from John Panasic. I hope I pronounced your name right. John, what originally caused the gorge to be where it is? Okay, well, the Columbia Gorge uh, is has probably been there for uh, at least twenty million years, um, and it it actually it was flowing through where near where it is today when the Columbia River basalts were coming out 17, seven, 17 million years as far far back as seventeen million years ago. Columbia Gorge was going, the uh, basalts were going in, in and through the Columbia Gorge. 
and getting out to the Pacific Ocean, there are actually lava flows. The salt lavas out on the Pacific coast that came from Eastern Washington or Eastern Oregon. So uh, it's been at least 17 million years. And uh, once it started, you know, once the, the river got established, it would tend to just keep going in the same direction. Even as the, as the Cascades were growing, the river was able to keep up with uh, downcutting uh, th through any of the uh, uh, Cascade volcanics that were accumulating in the gorge. The river, once it got established, would just eat through and cut through those and then uh, keep going as it had been. So, but it's been there for at least 20 million and maybe, uh, uh, maybe as, as long as 40 million years ago. We've had the Columbia River kind of going where it is today through the Columbia Gorge. Perfect. Thanks, Bruce. And I see we've got more questions on Zoom and in addition to Facebook, of course. And I'll just remind folks that if you guys do want to unmute and turn on your camera and ask Bruce your question, go ahead and make that note and your question on the chat. Otherwise, we'll just assume that you just want us to read the question and we'll go ahead and do that. Um, but over on Facebook, bouncing back to Facebook, we had Susan Leckband ask a question and she asked, are the decommissioned wells filled in so that they don't allow a pathway for contamination to seep into soil or groundwater? I'm not sure if that's a question <laughs> you can answer or not, Bruce. <laughs> Oh yeah, and that's yeah, Ed, and there's the answer is yes. Now uh, they're very uh, careful about well, they don't want to create any pathways for contaminants to move. So whenever they decommission a well, it's how it is backfilled. It's usually backfilled with clay, a very uh, like a bentonite clay or cement, so that uh, there's no chance for it to, to transmit any contaminants that might be moving uh, through the area. We had a question from Mark Hatchup wondering where are the gravel deposits pictured? Hmm. That is one problem with waiting till the end because we don't know what slide you might have been referring to. Uh, the gravel deposits for um, for the flood the, the flood gravel. I wonder if that's if that's what he's yes. asking. If it's <laughs> okay. the flood gravel, which is yeah, that's that's the most common gravel type deposit in, in this area and in Hanford. Those, uh, that picture was taken uh, with the flood gravels was taken uh, just north or near Richland. But those flood gravels uh, go all the way up the Columbia River uh, to Sentinel Gap. They tend to disappear as you go south uh, through across the Hanford site because that area was further from the high energy of the floods. And those areas uh, to the south are mostly sand and silt. So the gravel is kind of restricted, the flood gravels are kind of restricted to the northern and eastern part of the Hanford site. Awesome, thanks Bruce. And sorry everybody if you see me looking left and right, I've got a couple different screens up with uh, questions. Uh, <laughs> We've got another question on Facebook here for you. This one was asked by, let me scroll down here, um, by Ryan Bailey and Ryan asks, is Badger Mountain, Candy Mountain, Red Mountain and Rattlesnake Mountain all part of the Rattlesnake Fold? Um, that's all part of what we call the Rattlesnake Lula lineament or the Olympic Wallawa lineament uh, trends along those, those hills, those structures. And the rattlesnake fault is there is the there is a rattlesnake fault, but that's kind of re, it's kind of uh, restricted to the rattlesnake mountain. The rattlesnake mountain fault is also part of the the raw and the the owl. So there it's one very long feature. The rattlesnake fault is just one part of it, but those ridges, uh, Candy Mountain, Badger Mountain, Red Mountain are all on that same alignment. So they are connected and they are related to the same uh, tectonic uh, uh, elements. Great. Um, so we, uh, we had a question from Chris um, asking about the formation of rattlesnake, which I think you covered that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need to make sure that we're Clarifying fault and fold. Fold is where they're, mm -hmm. and then the faults are the breaks in them. So mm -hmm. Mark 
Derek asked, how active are the faults and has there been any trenching work specifically along Rattlesnake Mountain, the Rattlesnake Mountain Fault, that tells us just how large the earthquakes are, were, could be, and what the reoccurrence intervals might be. Uh -huh. Michael West's from the Colorado School of Mine work suggests earthquakes in excess of 7.0. Um, yeah, there has been trenching done along those faults. The trouble is they're really, they're, uh, they're low angle thrust faults, which is, in other words, they're the faults, they're not like this, they're low angle. And the, uh, this part, the southern part of the fault um, is moving up and over um, at fault. So if you, if you trench, it's, it's hard to trench going uh, sideways into the, to the mountain. When they trench, they usually go vertically like this. And so there, there have been uh, studies done, trenching done, there's been trenching done uh, and we'll little gap uh, along some faulting there. Uh, the trouble with trenching on the Hanford site and on Rattlesnake Mountain is its uh, tribal area. And the, it, the, the Native Americans are very sensitive about doing any uh, disturbance in that area. So there hasn't been a lot of trenching directly on Rattlesnake Mountain, but there's been other studies done, aeromag, uh, gravity surveys, lots of other surveys, geophysical surveys that have been performed to try to remotely detect uh, these faults. And so I think the historical earth, biggest earthquakes in our area are somewhere around five or six, magnitude five or six. I don't think we've had any going up to seven. Because uh, we're for, in our area, uh, we're further away from the major subduction going on on the West Coast over by Seattle off the west coast of Oregon and, and in Washington. So we don't, we're not likely to get as big of earthquakes here as we you'd see associated with these subduction zone earthquakes on the west side. So the further, we're quite a ways away from there. And if we had any uh, faulting uh, associated with those, those faults, the subduction faults, they'd be sub, uh, minimized uh, this far away in Eastern Washington. But we do have faults along the, these folds, these Yakima folds, and uh, that you know, that could be like um, those could be the, the faults that are generating these fives and sixes. And uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. It could be done on these these Yakima folds, and there will be studies done in the future, I'm sure. But uh, it's it's occurring slowly, and it's I'm sure it's not fast enough for a lot of people. But it costs money and it takes time. So awesome. Thank you, Bruce. Um, we had sure. one question that I kind of answered in the chat on Facebook, but it'd be good to ask it over uh, over Zoom. Um, and that was another question by Susan asking if this presentation is going to be available on the college's website. Uh, answer is yes. After last event, we put up a little section on the public education page on, on our Hanford web pages that shares the presentations from these events. Um, we're going to be sending out a social media post uh, after this event when that gets posted. So we will put the slides up there uh, probably in the next day or so, and we'll get that, that put up um, and we'll share the link on social media and we'll probably send out an email list like we did the last go around. Uh, and, and before we go into another live question, I thought we could skip over and, and start knocking out some of the pre-submitted questions too. Um, so we had a couple of questions asked from Philip over, uh, over email before this event started. And Bruce, I know you kind of covered this in your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, Philip asked, how was the Sentinel gap formed? Um, I, I guess if you have any other thoughts to add to that from your presentation, um, do you have anything else you want to add on that topic? Okay, well, that's, that's a good question. Uh, we have several gaps, you know, the Sentinel gap, the Lula gap, uh, Frenchman gap. These are all places where the Columbia River cuts through and inclines these ridges of the salt that's been have been squeezed and pushed up along these uh, those areas. And uh, the fact that the Columbia River was able to cut through each of those gaps is an indication that 
these, these ridges weren't growing very fast. They were growing very slowly over a long period of time, million, 10, you know, 10 or 12 million years, these ridges have been, these, they've been growing. But the river has been able to keep up as the, as the ridges have slowly rise, the river has been able to maintain its channel through those, through, through those ridges. So Sentinel Gap is just one, it's one of many water gaps where the Columbia River has been able to keep up with the tectonic uh, uh, upfolding of these ridges. Did you, let's see. Um, oh, how about how many, this is another one from Phil, how many distinct Columbia River channels cross the Hanford Reservation? Well, there's, besides the one that, where the river is now, there's been one other major uh, channel where the Columbia River used to go. And that was through uh, Gable Gap, which is on the Hanford site. It's kind of in the middle of the Hanford so we have Gable Mountain and Gable Butte. And in between, we have a, a channel that was cut by the Columbia River. And we know that by looking at the boreholes and the sediments uh, that are in the gap that are uh, characteristic of the Columbia River. So that was from there. I mean, the river did cut through uh, Gable Gap and then it kind of headed south and west, kind of parallel to, to where it runs today, but it was probably a few miles uh, west of where it is today. And it's, it's buried, now it's buried under you know, these, all these younger sediments that came in later. Awesome, thanks Bruce. Uh, next question comes from Facebook and this one is from uh, Leila, Leila, apologize if I miss up your name. This question was, so will the Yakima folds continue to fold further? Will the Yakima folds continue to fold further? Yes, definitely. Uh, it's been, they've been going on, this has been going on for um, at least 12 million, 17 million years. And the chances are of it continuing uh, are high, especially considering we, we're, we're, conti we're continuing to have this tectonic rotation of, of Eastern Washington. And as long as that keeps rotating, uh, there's, there's going to, the stress is still there to create and to continue, force these folds to continue to keep growing. Um, Gerald Yorioka asked, how far back can we trace the continental hotspot that moved east to its current location? And was it close to Hanford? The, uh, yeah, the, uh, well, the, the Yellowstone hotspot um, is actually, it's migrated from where it is now. It used to be down in Southern Oregon, uh, Northern California. That's where it was about, uh, I think around 30 or 40 million years ago. The, that Yellowstone hotspot was under uh, that area, but the, because of tectonic rotation, the, uh, the Earth's crust, the North American plate is rotated. And the, and the, the hot spot is, has moved uh, as the North American plate moved. It, it, it migrated from Southern Oregon to Wyoming, uh, Eastern Idaho and Wyoming, where it is today. So yes, uh, it was never, the Yellowstone hotspot was never directly underneath Hanford or Washington but it was much further south than, um, than, um, than Washington. I'm gonna jump in and do a follow-up because we're talking about this rotation. Jeanette, mm -hmm. do we feel the clockwise rotational movements that are measured via GPS? Like, is that something, can, is that picked up, I guess, by like size, seismic machines or how do you know? No, no not really. Um, there's no seismic, it's not tied to the seismicity. It's at these GPS units when they, they've got hundreds of these spread out across the, the Pacific Northwest. And, and what they're, they're, they do is they're recording their location. And that locate, their location is, is migrating, is changing over time. So in one year, they're located because they're highly precise. 
they can measure 20 millimeters of movement in one year over time. I mean, each one of these, and in that most of the most amount of movement is going on in Western Oregon, in Washington, in Washington. And under Pendleton, we have they have these same GPS units, and there's no move, no movement because it's at the focal point for the rotation. And in eastern Washington, eastern Washington, there's not there's, there's not as much motion either because it's closer to that pivot point. The further further away from the pivot point you get, the more rotation you're going to see because of you know angular momentum and all that stuff. So. But so yeah, we don't feel not we will never feel or detect any motion in our you know humans are not able to detect that small amount of motion, but these GPS sensors can, and they do. Perfect, thanks, Bruce. Uh, I have a couple of questions on Facebook. This first one comes from uh, Teresa, and Teresa asked, "Is Idaho affected by the rotation?" And this was asked back around the uh, slides involving Ringold, and it might have been the slide right before the Ringold formation slide. Um, is Idaho affected by the rotation? It is by the fact that the Yellowstone hotspot is my has migrated underneath Idaho and into Wyoming where it is today. So it has been invo involved, but it's mainly southern Idaho. I think northern Idaho may be more fixed in its position and maybe uh, not moving as much, but southern Idaho is is definitely is is part of the story of rotation. Awesome. Thanks, Bruce. We've got I'm just scrolling back up to the next question, make sure we're going a little uh, in order here. This one comes from Susan Luckband again. And Susan asked, have any precious metals ever been discovered at Hanford? <laughs> Not yet. There's a lot of metal associated with contents of the tanks. The, uh, you know, the underground storage tanks at Hanford, but they're, they're, I think they're more in a liquid form. Um, but as far as the, the uh, you know, the Ringgold formation, the basalt, Ringgold, Hanford, they're not, uh, they're very rare, they're very, uh, they have trace metals, trace amounts of metals associated with the sediments that are in them, but they'll never be of economic value because they're not concentrated enough. They're very, very minute quantity, quantities of precious metals that are within those deposits. So, and basalt is, is very, is really not uh, a very, it's not economically valuable as a, as a resource. Gotcha. Thanks, Bruce. And I don't know, I wanna consider this natural metals Apparently, back you know, decades ago, somebody uh, robbed the White Bluffs Bank and made off somewhere between Hanford and and uh, Wenatchee, and then they were shot before they re recovered the treasure. So there, there might be some treasure buried <laughs> between here and Wenatchee. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, that may still be out there. Right? Yeah. Good luck. Right. Good luck finding it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we have a question that came from Mark Derrick. Derrick. On Zoom, many neotectonics geologists would argue that the faults along Rattlesnake and Umtana Ridge are truly very dangerous. Why have there not been more studies? Or why have studies? I'm sorry. Why have the studies not been uh, studied more seriously? There we go. <laughs> Thoroughly, maybe. Well, we have a, we have a record of seismicity going back 100 years or so. And there, there have been no big earthquakes on at Hanford. There was one down in uh, down the Milton near Milton Freewater, uh, east of here. There was one over in the Cascades uh, near Wenatchee that I think maybe went up to like um, maybe six or seven. Uh, but locally. Uh, there's been, and the, and the, the, and they've looked at records that people have made over the years. People living here 100 years ago, you know, reported may have reported some shaking going on and 
they've been able to estimate uh, how how big those earthquakes were by uh, by the by the number of people that reported it and where they where they were located. And there have been no major earthquakes to that would cause serious damage yet. But that doesn't mean there won't be any in the future. But based on the last hundred years of record, there has been no major no major earthquakes in, in this area. And the further away you are from the earthquake, the less uh, damaging it is. So, and there have been no major earthquakes recorded in close by to the to the Hanford site yet but it doesn't mean it won't happen in the future. And seismologists are studying these structures that are generating earthquakes. And uh, so far, I have not heard about any alarm, there being alarm or imminent huge earthquakes occurring uh, in our immediate area. Awesome, thank you, Bruce. Uh, one quick question that I can jump in before we do another geology question was this comes from Inga on Facebook and Inga asked, any chance this presentation will be recorded for rewatch? Um, yes, the uh, immediately after the event, um, this recording will buffer a little bit on Facebook and then you can watch the recording on Facebook. And that'll be both on our uh, Washington Department of Ecology Hanford Facebook page and it'll also be on the event page for this for, the, for tonight's event. And also tomorrow, I'm gonna to go and upload this to the Ecology YouTube channel so you can watch it on the Ecology YouTube as well. Um, and Bruce, we have a question from uh, Wind Campbell on Facebook. And Wind asks, are the sand dunes accessible to the public or are they only on the Hanford site itself? Um, well, the, uh, the sand dunes I showed in the video, those are, uh, those are actually, uh, well, some of them are on Hanford site. Some of them are on Department of Fish and Wildlife land, which is generally inaccessible to the public. Uh, you can actually, if you have a if you have a motorboat, you could you could go up the Columbia River and actually access those sand dunes um, that, that are in the national the U.S. Fish and Wildlife land. But the best place to see sand dunes uh, in public land is up uh, near the uh, White Bluffs Ferry Landing, which is up uh, north along the Columbia River. And you can drive there. It's on fish and wildlife land, public land. You can actually hike to some beautiful sand dunes that are up high along the river. And I showed them those big, those big long sand dunes that are in my video um, along the river. You, those, are, those are open to the public. And I highly recommend going up there. I, I love going up there and just hiking, you can hike for miles up there and hardly see anybody and have the place to yourself. So if you wanna see sand dunes, I'd, I'd recommend going up to the, by the White Plus Ferry Landing and taking the trail that leaves from there. Awesome, thank you, Bruce. And Ginger, before I answer your question, I was gonna say, uh, Ginger shared a link in the chat that, that shares the White Plus Ferry Landing. I'll go ahead and put that link into the Facebook chat and mm -hmm. go ahead and ask your question. And uh, just a warning, I went out there a couple of weeks ago, and if you try to go right now, it is extremely muddy at the top, and the mud is actually <laughs> cliche clay, and it's very, very slippery, and it will build up on your boots to where you feel like you have, I don't know, moon boots on. So just exercise yeah. caution, and if you have hiking poles, I would recommend bringing them. Mm. Um, <laughs> so let's see, uh, we have another question from Philip. What is the origin of Gable Mountain? It seems out of place sticking up in the middle of the basin. Yeah, that's a good question. It's just kind of sitting, sitting out there all by itself. It's actually, it's actually an extension of Umtanum Ridge. Oh, right. It's the same, it's the same Yakima fold as Umtanum Ridge, but there's a gap in between um, Umtanum and Gable that's filled with sediments. That's why you don't see it's it's there, but it's under underground where you can't see it. So there, Gable Mountain is connected to um, Tannum Ridge and does continue across the Hanford site, but it does it does peter out as it goes east, it disappears. Like most other the Yakima folds, they do peter out uh, to the east.
Awesome. Thanks, Bruce. Sorry, I'm just uh, navigating my way through the through the sea of, of comments over here. Uh, this one comes from Linda, and Linda actually asks you, Bruce, have, have you had a chance to visit the Mammoth excavation site out off of Claude Felter? The answer is yes, I have. Uh, it's been a few years since I was there, and uh, I've gone I've gone out there with George last and Gary Klein Connect, who are the two two of the big two of the leaders. Uh, involved in that. Uh, I haven't been heavily or directly involved just because uh, they don't really, they don't need another geologist out there. George is doing a, a great job, a uh, thorough job. And, you know, uh, I believe in division of labor. I mean, he's, he's doing a good job, so I don't need to get it, go there and get in his way or try to reinterpret what he's doing. So, um, that's why I've I've kind of stayed clear of there, and I, I I like to keep up on what what's going on and what's happening out there, but I'm not really directly involved in that. Let's see. Um, yet another wonderful question from Philip, and that is, um, how were the White Bluffs formed? It seems strange to have such an abrupt elevation change. From there is. The there is a big change. Yeah. 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 The, uh, the bluffs, the white bluffs stick up um, about 600 feet above the river. So that's quite a bit of quite a change. And the answer is that at one time the ring cold formation used to fill up the valley up to the level of the top of the bluffs. So at one time there was no, uh, the river uh, would flow through here, but it was up at the level of the top of the bluffs. And since about three million years ago, the, this area has has either there's either been some pushing up of the land surface associated with the Cascade, the growth of the Cascade Mountains, perhaps, or maybe due to the the, the changes in the the flow of the Snake River coming in um, and causing the the level of the river to drop very suddenly to drop 600 feet uh, below where it is today. But the youngest flood, the youngest Ringgold formation we see is about 3 million years ago. So that change, that sudden drop in the river level occurred about 3 million years ago. And it's, it's pretty much stabilized. I mean, it's, it's pretty much been where it, at the level it's at now for at least about a million years. So it's not gonna continue to, to probably erode much deeper than where it is, where it is now. But there was a drastic change starting at three million years ago, but it seems to have stabilized for now. Excellent, thanks, Bruce. Uh, this question comes from Jeff Reister on Facebook, and Jeff asks, "Do you know if geology was considered when choosing Hanford as a nuclear site, based on what has been learned about the geology in the last eighty years? Was Hanford a good choice?" Uh, if I interpret the question, uh, is was Hanford a good choice for choosing for a waste site? I assume that was that's the question. And if, if that's yeah, the question, was... the answer. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. The answer is definitely yes. Um, they could have not picked. I don't think a better site to store nuclear and hazardous waste than they did at Hanford. And the reason I say that is because. Uh, most of the waste are stored up on the Hanford Plateau, uh, which is a huge flood bar that was created by ice age floods that came into the basin. And because of that, the, the accumulation of sediment on that flood bar, flood deposits, they, it now lies 300 feet above the, the, the water table. So I really, uh, that means the, the waste that are stored on, in the 200 areas on the Hanford site, uh, there's a long distance, a great distance between where the, the waste are stored near the surface and the water table. So I, I think they picked a very good choice, a very uh, good place to, to store, even though they didn't know it at the time or they didn't appreciate it or understand. Back then in the 40s, they didn't understand geology or the hydrology of the Hanford site. And it was just fortuitous that they did pick uh, the, a place like the Hanford Plateau 
uh, the 200 area plateau for uh, those first roaring ways. So I, you know, I think we uh, we should be happy for that. But there are somewhat there are st some ways that are uh, that were discharged along the river at, at the uh, along the react where the reactors are, which did cause problems and cause contamination to go into the river. Yeah, but that's but the Hanford area, the, Han the 200 area plateau is separate from that, and uh, that's 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 where most of the underground storage tanks are located, or up there in the 200 area plateau. And just uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with other DOE sites, I believe the tanks at Savannah, the Savannah River site, are actually in the water table. So by comparison, mm -hmm. <laughs> very lucky that ours are well above yep. the water table. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, so let's see, are there any markers <laughs> of Ice Age floods on the Hanford Reservation other than erratics? And speaking of erratics, are there any large, say, two meters square or cubed uh, erratics anywhere accessible to the public locally? Um, let's see, there's some, that sounds like two questions. Uh, first of all, are there, are there flood features on the Hanford site? And the, and the answer is yes. There's some beautiful uh, channels that were eroded uh, on the Hanford site. And there were some uh, great, wonderful uh, flood bars or areas where flood deposits were accumulated, like we just talked about on the 200, 200 area plateau. So there are, there are lots of flood features. Uh, some of them are fairly unique to, to anywhere else that are present on Hanford. And the second question was, uh, are there erratics? Uh, a good place for to go look at erratics, and the answer is uh, the answer is yes. But I'm trying to think of the best the best places. You can see some uh, few, walking along. They? Pardon me. Doesn't Candy Mountain have quite a few? Yeah, actually, Candy. Yeah, Candy Mountain. There's a we put in a they put in a new trail where they actually have an interpretive. Uh, hike on Candy Mountain where there are erratics identified, and there are also some on uh, Badger Mountain as well. So those two places, and also if uh, there's public there's public state land um, over on off of uh, Highway 225, I think it is. That's the road that goes to Bennett City from Hanford, where uh, Rattlesnake Slope. Area that's public land uh, um, owned by the state. You can hike up onto there and see some nice erratics up there, as well as Bergen Mounds. There's Bergen Mounds up there on Rattlesnake Slope as well on the public uh, part of that area. So there are this Rattlesnake Slope, Candy Mountain, Red Mountain. Red Mountain is kind of off limits, but Candy Mountain and Badger Mountain all have uh, erratics where you can actually. Uh, see them up close and personal. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Lorraine, I see you have your camera turned on. Did you have a question for Bruce? No? Okay, no worries. Uh, let me go ahead and go back to Facebook here. Um, okay, this one comes from Jodina Lakey, and Jodina asks, there are several noticeable basalt column formations. Please explain how some are pillar and some are swirled. Some are pillar and some are what? Swirled. Swirled. That's a new term I've I haven't heard for basalt before, but I think uh, yeah, there's like I was showing in my, in my presentation. I was showing you the difference between uh, columnar basalt, which where you get get these beautiful columns uh, going vertically, uh, polygonal, five or six sided columns, and other places you get really these tight, uh, tight fractures, and these are all cooling fractures that, that were created as the lava was cooling. Um, and those are just uh, a lot of lava flows have both features. Uh, the thinner flows don't have the columnar basalt 
generate it because you really need a thick flow for these columns to, to start forming. So if you have a thinner basalt flow, a lot of times all you'll have is the, the tightly fractured, randomly fractured entablature. But other, some of the thicker flows, you'll also actually also see some curving columns. You'll see vertical columns, but you'll also see some curving, which I assume she's referring to as swirling. You could see some swirling going on in these uh, thicker lava flows that uh, cool, that are allowed to cool more slowly. So, uh, so thicker flows, you'll see more columns. Thinner flows, you'll see mostly just entablature. Awesome, thanks, Bruce. This next question on Facebook is a bit of a two-parter, and, and I know Ginger and I could definitely touch on the second part, but uh, uh, William, we already asked, oh, yes, William Lakey asks, are there any fossilized bones around the area in Hanford, and are there any natives that roamed around this area of Washington? Um, do you want to touch on that first part, Bruce? Uh, are there any bones exposed? Yeah. And yeah, are there uh, any fossilized bones around the Hanford area? Not, not that I know of. And they're the only place I have seen fossils in the Ringgold Formation along the White Bluffs. But you know, most of Hanford is buried under flood deposits and sand dunes, so that you're, you know, to find a fossil on on the Hanford side is pretty rare. Uh, but if you wanted to look for fossils, you could. I know they've been found in the in the Ringgold Formation. Uh, along the white bluffs. Awesome, thank you. And Ginger, did you want sure. to touch on the second part of that question? Sure, uh, yeah, before the white settlers, there have been natives in this space and since uh, time immemorial, as they say, um, the Northern part of the Hanford site is home to the Wanapum people. They are not a treaty tribe, but they still are alive and well. And their little village is uh, there near um, Wanapum Dam between Priest Rapids and Wanapum Dam out in Ottawa. And um, the Yakima Nation also uh, used the area and as well as the Umatilla, Nez Perce, Walla Walla, Cayuse, Palouse, uh, uh, many tribes. In fact, I will pop a really cool map uh, link into the into the chat and can put it on Facebook. Um, I said Yakima, not Yakima. Yakima is a city. Yakima are the people. Um, <laughs> anyway, and of course, you know, I'll, I'll send the map. I'll put the map link in, and you'll see that um, territories often are the constructs of the white people that came later on. And many of these people traveled about and um, had summer villages and winter villages. And um, but the Wanapum had permanent villages where Hanford is now, and were kicked off when the government took over. Thanks, Ginger. Uh, another question on Facebook was from from Jan, and Jan asks: You may have been asked what geological reality of Hanford area is the biggest threat in terms of the nuclear facilities and the contamination contained there. I know you kind of touched on this a little, little bit earlier with the geology and, and kind of where things are located at Hanford, but do you have anything else that you wanted to touch on that topic? Um, no, I don't really have anything to add. Um, there's, I mean, there's always a uh, meteor impact or comet. <laughs> Striking the earth or striking Hanford, there's always a possibility of something like that, random acts happening like that that we can't predict. Um, earthquakes, um, I don't think that's, I mean, we do have earthquakes, but they're not the, you know, the kind that tend to uh, destroy uh, buildings uh, in this area. So. Awesome. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, another quick one. I'm um, just trying to catch up on Facebook a little bit here. Uh, this one comes from Ben Blanchard, and Ben asks, "What is the bet or what is the beer bottle brown clear obsidian-like rock that can be found in the area?" What is the what? <laughs> uh, what is the beer bottle brown clear obsidian oh. that can be found in the area? Beer beer bottle brown. Yeah. Um. <laughs> uh, it's probably glass, maybe associated with the basalt. 
basalt is can be brown and you know when it's weathered it it goes it turns from black to brown or red reddish uh, doesn't and there is some glass you do, do occasionally see glass forming from basalt so I, that would be my guess i don't know of anything else that uh that fits that description besides basalt in this area <laughs> i was thinking it was probably just a beer bottle that somebody melted maybe heck yeah broken, a broken <laughs> beer bottle a bunch of teenagers out partying yes where exactly did you find <laughs> this, this glass um okay where when and where no when and why did the yakima river turn so abruptly north at benton city before that didn't it just flow through badger canyon um and then did it always turn south abruptly near Horn Rapids or did it ever flow across the current Hanford site? Well, the, the, uh, the questioner an answered his own question and that it did. Before, uh, before the floods, the Yakima River flowed down the Yakima Valley and went straight at Kiona and went straight down Badger Coulee and then entered into, uh, and, you know, joined the, the Columbia River, you know, by uh, in Kennewick, and uh, and what happened during the floods is the floods came in and they invade, you know, the flood waters flowed into Badger Coulee, and the waters slowed down such that there was a lot of sediment deposition that occurred as that water slowed down and it actually plugged uh, Badger Coulee with sediment. And we can see that there's a gravel pit uh, in Badger Coulee where we can actually see the evidence for that. So the, uh, the, the floods, the accumulation of flood deposits caused the river, the Yakima River to take that sharp end to, up to the north towards Hanford. And then um, at the horn at the horn of the Yakima uh, form to where it is today. Perfect. Thanks. And, and it's probably stuck in that position too. So who knows? Gotcha. So I know we I know we have a couple minutes left here, but I think if we might be able to get in these last couple of questions if we go a little bit okay. past seven, if that's okay. That's We've, okay. Um, one question from Michael that asks, uh, having been to the Ringled Cliffs, the hydraulic impacts from irrigation are clear. Uh, what are the impacts to Hanford from irrigation and river hydrology changes? Um, what are the effects of irrigation on Hanford? Yeah, what are question? the impacts, Yeah, what are the impacts to Hanford from irrigation and river hydrology changes? Um, well, the, the I don't think that, I don't think there are really any effects of irrigation except uh, where there. Where there's landslides going on along the White Bluffs from um, over irrigation above the bluffs, it's causing landslides to move, uh, force the uh, river towards Hanford. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be a threat. It's not really. I mean, the river's not really. That doesn't really impact the river that's going uh, along Hanford. It does. It does push the. The, the river away slightly. Um, so I don't, I don't think there are any direct impacts of irrigation on Hanford. Okay. Um, another question, this one comes from Tom Cecilia and Tom asks, is uplift still happening and what could that mean for the Columbia Channel? Yeah, there is uplift going on in the, along the ridges, it continues to, to grow. Um, And so that is the as the ridges continue to get pushed up, the river will keep cutting down to compensate for that uplift. It'll 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 erode down. And it wants to establish the the, the river. It wants to keep the river at its present height uh, or or elevation. So if the river if the, the ridges rise up, the river's going to want to cut down and will cut down through into the basalt to maintain the channel of the river where it is today.
have, I have my very own question. Um, from Highway 240, driving north, so on the right, not the Rattlesnake side, but somewhere on the site, um, between Horn Rapids and the um, exit towards the waste treatment plant, and I don't know, what is that, Beloit, I think. The little mound that looks, it's like a perfect little pyramid or a perfect little, uh, like a little mini yeah. volcano, and I've always wondered what that is. It's called Goose Egg Hill. And, you know, I've thought about that and I've looked at it a lot of times and I still don't know for sure. I don't know exactly. I don't have a good explanation for it. Some people thought, think it, people in the past have thought it was a bergamot, but it's too big and it's too perfectly symmetrical. It's, and it comes to too, too much of a point. Most, most bergamots are flat, you know, like this. And Goose Egg Hill is kind of like this. And I've driven by it a few times and there's no ice wrapped debris associated with that, with that mound. So what I think it is, is I think my guess is that it's, it's, these are flood deposits and there's just been streams that have eroded around the margin of this thing and isolated it to look like a mound like it is today. But I, I really, I'm not 100% satisfied with that explanation. And there could be another explanation, but I have no idea what it is. So I have to admit, you know, I don't know everything. <laughs> no worries. For you. Um, <laughs> so we've got, I, I, on my end, um, I, I've been monitoring Facebook. We have just a couple questions left. This one comes from uh, uh, William Lakey again. And William asks, Bruce, what causes the basalt to curl? causes the basalt to curl? Is that the question? Curl. Um, I assume they're meaning uh, why does it form columns that kind of sometimes, you know, they, so. most, co most columns are vertical, but some columns tend to, they do curl or bend in different directions. And uh, th that's all the, the formation of columns is related to the cooling of the lava. So when the lava first came out, it was liquid magma and it had to have been it had flowed. Sometimes it flowed tens or hundreds of miles before it finally came to a rest. And once it came to rest, it would start cooling uh, mainly from the top down. And the, uh, the bottom of the flow is here. So it started cooling for the, with a crust at the top and then slowly that that crust would would uh, cool down to a certain level, and that's called what's called the entablature, until it reached a critical depth, and then the columns would start to form as it cooled from the bottom up and from the top down. You get these columns forming in uh, what we call the colonnade. And sometimes uh, the lava flow would not be uh, flat; it would be maybe coming up against a valley. A channel on the side. So we have a lava flow coming into a channel that's dipping down like this, and the lava would fill up this area. And as, as it did, the columns would tend to they'd bend towards the margins of the channel. The cooling the, the, the columns would form at right angles to the cooling front of the basalt lava. So it's it's fairly complicated. You don't see these curving columns very often, but what you do a lot of times are associated with irregularities in the channel for the where the basalt came in. So it's 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 a complex, not always straightforward um, formation of these columns. Awesome, that's super fascinating. Um, so another one of our last few Facebook questions was, uh, aside from the Columbia River, is there any geological formation that contributes to the east side of Washington that made it best suitable for produce growing? Could you repeat that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, aside from the Columbia River, is there any geological formation that contributes to the east side of Washington that made it best suitable for produce growing? Um, besides the Columbia River, well, we have the Snake River um, that comes into the Columbia and you know, goes to the goes eastward towards uh, 
Idaho. In that area, I mean, that area is also producing, uh, it's, they're using water to produce crops along the Snake River as well. You know, wine growing is real popular in Eastern Washington and Idaho. So, you know, besides the Columbia, there, there is the Snake River. It's uh, almost as big and uh, it also produces lots of agriculture. What about the soil soil depth? Um, fertile soil was is is a lot of the soil depth due to volcanic deposition or stuff that came on after the floods and not that the floods hit everything. Yeah, well, there's there's soil depths and the soils are coming from are, are being generated by a lot of different uh, processes. You have uh, you know the Ringgold Formation from the ancestral Columbia River. You have flood deposits. Um, particularly fine grain flood deposits are great for growing crops because they have a lot of silt in them and they retain a lot of moisture, which farmers, you know, which allow the, the crops to, to, to thrive. And uh, there's also the Palouse. The area of the, the Palouse is a great, but one of the biggest wheat, wheat growing uh, areas in the, in the world is the Palouse, you know, which is the area east and north of us. And that's all windblown silt, mostly windblown mm -hmm. silt and sand that are coming from flood deposits. I mm -hmm. mean, as the floods came in, came in, the winds would blow that stuff back up onto the Palouse. Um, so we have a lot of different soil types uh, that are producing agriculture, uh, a thriving agriculture of Eastern Washington. Awesome. So I think I've got just one more question on Facebook for you, Bruce, and I think we'll, and we'll check back with Ginger okay. to get any more questions. This question comes from Michael Milan, and Michael asks, uh, there appeared to be a prolonged period of unconformity, non-deposition uh, slash erosion in the regional geological column you showed early on. Can you speak to what was happening regionally then? Well, yeah, that gap in the time was mainly between the Ringgold formation and the flood deposits, or the Hanford Formation, as we call it. And um, the last flood deposits were 15 to 20,000 years ago. And the last ring gold was about 3 million. So, so that's quite a gap. But before the last flood, before the last floods, earlier in the, the Ice Age goes back to almost 2.5 million years ago. So we could have had flood deposits coming in uh, as early as two and a half million years ago. So that's only a gap of half a million years, which isn't a lot. But a, a lot of that, uh, a lot of the stratigraphic column is missing because of the, uh, the Ringgold formation, the cut uh, that suddenly dropped into in the Pasco Basin and, and eroded down uh, below river level. So there's, there's, there are big gaps in time but they're mainly related to the changes in the river level of the Columbia River. Cool. I do have one more question, and that is, do you okay. know if anybody has um, any bathymetric maps of the river channel from before the McNary Pool, or have you ever seen any historic photos of the channel before the McNary Pool? Because there's the islands and stuff out there, and I don't uh, know what they look like. Uh, you know, I don't know. I haven't I haven't seen any maps like that, but it doesn't mean they they don't exist. Um, before the dams, they they would have had to have been, you know, back from the what was it fifties or, or something. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I would I would like contact the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, uh, those people. I bet if their maps exist, I bet they would they would know about them and and make them available. Good point. Good point. Uh -huh. Well, thank you so much. Uh -huh. this has been great. Um, we uh -huh. have, I think, up to how many people do we have? Up to hundred people. 80? Yeah, I think we had up yeah. to ninety-two or ninety-three on Facebook. Wow, that's and great. Up to popular. I think we uh -huh. had about. I think we have about 62 to 65 on. Wow. So definitely a great, great. Bruce, really fast. I just wanted to share a comment. Awesome. 
this, All right, thank you for having me. Yeah, and no worries. Uh, Bruce, one sec. I had a, a comment we wanted to share with you. This one came from Dan Haas. He just said, uh, got to oh, go. No, Dan. As always, it never ceases to amaze me that every time I listen to you, I learn more fascinating things. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Yeah, in fact, I would- Thank you, everybody. If you want to turn on your cameras and, and if you're on Zoom still, that would be fun for everybody to give. Uh, the, hey. Thank you. Um, and, oh, I don't know if you can turn on your cameras. Maybe we have that control. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, this, yeah. um, if you guys have any questions to follow up, don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And our next topic in March will be the liquid effluent uh, treatment facility and the uh, liquid effluent or effluent treatment facilities on hand for it. So these will be much more cleanup related as well as our 242A evaporator, which is a really important tool to help minimize the amount of waste that we're gonna be treating. And thank you so much everybody for, for watching and helping make this a successful event. And Ryan, do you have any last minute, last final words? Uh, I don't think I have a lot of final words. I'll just share what I've shared a couple times during the meeting, but this, this event will be available to view on Facebook after the event. You can look at our Facebook page or the Facebook event page. And also tomorrow at some point, I'll have the video uploaded to YouTube. So if you missed you know, part of the event or you want to just rewatch it, you can check it out on any of those channels um, you know, in the next 12 to 24 hours. Uh, but again, thank you everybody so much for, for joining tonight. And, and Bruce, do you have any final thoughts you want to share? No, thanks. No, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Right, thanks, everyone. Have Bye. a good night.